Hi there and welcome back to this third of four videos. Before I move on to exploring some of the holistic dimensions relevant to genders, sexualities and identities, uh, let me give you a little bit of feedback um, on the exercise that you've just undertaken. So hopefully you'll have thought of quite a few ideas yourselves, especially for the restraining forces and the facilitating or enabling forces. And it would be really great for you to be able to share those with us, either share them with your colleagues um, online on your courses, um, or copy me in as well, or and copy me in as well, um, on Twitter. You might wonder why I keep on about encouraging you to do things on Twitter. Well, it's a great platform for sharing learning uh, be between people. So especially if you're using a hashtag, that sign, um, Say, for example, if you use the sign um, hashtag safeguarding, then anyone around the world that's looking for safeguarding issues could search for hashtag safeguarding and everything that people have written on Twitter about it would all come up there. So it's a really good way of you sharing your learning with others. And that helps to build... Uh, something else for you as well that's called your academic citizenship. So it's getting your profile out there. It's more people to know about some of your ideas and the ways you can interact with others. Really fantastic because you might build up wonderful friendships with people. Um, you might get people offering to share their work with you, share some articles, uh, or inform you about conferences, even find jobs on there. There are lots of really positive ways. So, and that's one of the things you can do with your learning here, to be able to share it with others. So when it comes to the restraining forces, Sometimes when I've done this in class and from Andrew's original research, um, some of the reasons are routine and regular things that you might expect anyway. It's people saying, well, our trust hasn't got the money or we haven't got the time. We wouldn't have the staff and the resources. So there are lots of the typical things that can come out, but also there are wider issues as well. And um, some of the ones that often come out around restrain uh, their restraining forces might be that people will say things like, uh, well, if this is an online service, how do we know the people contacting us are actually between 16 to 24? Supposing it's somebody under 16 years old. And what are the safeguarding implications if we're going to start sending out free condoms to people under the age of 16? Now, that's really important to consider, especially in relation to um, the Fraser Guidelines. So in the UK, we have these things called the Fraser Guidelines, which were specifically uh, written by Lord Justice Fraser, and it's to address issues about what happens with a young person under the age of consent, which in the UK is 16, but over the age of 12, so between 13 to um, 16. Because the Sexual Offences Act of 2003 said that anybody under the age of 13, so up to the age of 12, um, is not mature enough. They cannot give consent to sex. So anyone of 12 or below, the law says they cannot give consent to sex. But between 13 to 16 is this real grey area, what to do with people who are under the age of consent, but the sex, you know, about a third of them will be having sex and therefore surely it's better to enable them to have sex safer rather than not address them at all. And that's why the Fraser guidelines were originally brought in, uh, particularly around the issues of contraception. So, supposing you have got someone given this argument, well, um, we could have children under the age of 16 contacting us, uh, so wouldn't that be making them more vulnerable? In many ways, no. And that was what Andrew Evans found when he uh, was doing the research on which he based his article. Because there is no law against the, um, the age at which somebody can buy condoms. So theoretically, you might have a 10-year-old going into um, the pet petrol station or to a, a coin-operated machine. There's no law against people buying condoms at any age whatsoever. So a positive or a facilitating argument might be, even if young people are under the age of 16, if they're accessing your service, then maybe you've got ways of referring them to face-to-face -face services elsewhere. 
And especially if they've got worries or concerns or they've got somebody that they want to talk to, it's a real good opportunity that you're now getting them um, involved with the online service. Whereas if that service wasn't available, then there's nothing preventing them going to a coin-operated machine and buying condoms anyway. Or chances are they're not going to access condoms in the first place. OK, so that's what you might have been thinking about with some of your restraining and facilitating forces. Another thing, you might be wondering why I keep using the phrase condomless sex all the time. Well, later on on this learning resource, you'll see that I've written a glossary and I've covered that term there for you. OK. Right. Now, I want to focus for a moment on the holistic dimensions, because uh, so many nurses and other healthcare professionals uh, proclaim that they're caring for their clients holistically. And as you can see from the heading here, no health without sexual health would be a slogan that I'd be really happy using. Um, it first came out a few years ago when people were talking about it in regards to mental health, saying that there's no health without mental health. Well, I would argue similarly, especially from a holistic point of view, that there's no sex, uh, no health without sexual health. So if we say we're addressing our clients holistically and we're not dealing with with issues or matters of uh, genders, sexual identities, um, uh, uh, safeguarding around any of these, then we are not addressing our clients holistically. So for each and every person you see as a health or social care client, um, think about sexual health as a dimension of their holistic health and well-being. I'll cover this in more depth in another video at a later time. But it's really important that we focus on the fact that sexual health is part of the holistic dimensions of uh, being a human. Another important aspect, it's written here as the associated sexual health matters, and that could be any other conditions a person has, whether they're spiritual, physical, uh, um, uh, psychological, no matter what dimension of a person's life, if they've got some particular condition that's now being impacted on by their sexual well-being or the other way around, their condition may be impacting on their sexual health and their wellness. OK, so that's really important as well. And think of lots of the examples that are so easy to come to mind. Um, you might think of a man with uh, diabetes, of which 50% of them will, at some point in their lives, have problems with erections. So if you're a diabetes nurse specialist and you're fantastic at dealing with issues around blood glucose levels, uh, diet, exercise, you're really great at that. But if you don't mention something about erections when one in two of your clients will have problems, then you're not dealing with them holistically. Or supposing it's a person with particular mental health issues. Maybe they're on certain drugs that will mean that by using uh, particular contraceptives, those and their psychiatric drugs are not going to work well together. OK, so there are impacts of other conditions people may have. And it might even be things like being stigmatised. Supposing you have people with particular types of um, uh, disabilities and because they've been stigmatised and discriminated against because of those disabilities, it means that their sexual health and well-being is often sidelined too. OK, and the third dimension uh, that's showing here would be the sexual health specifics. So when anybody uses the term sexual health, quite often individuals will think of well, sexual infections, HIV, teenage pregnancies, unplanned conceptions, abortion, psychosexual issues. They're the usual things that lots of people would consider when they use the term sexual health. So I'd say that because we're talking about looking after our clients holistically, we've got to consider at least these three particular dimensions here. A particular issue of great importance in relation both to safeguarding and to sexual health and well-being is to do with the person's um, self-appreciation of themselves. So whether you want to call that uh, self-esteem, self-regard, self-love, um, how a person perceives themselves and especially in their relations with others then.
And one of the problems for both safeguarding and sexual health is when a person has low self-esteem. If a person has very little regard for themselves, then there's far more chances that they may take um, uh, risks or do things that otherwise they wouldn't really have done had they felt uh, stronger about themselves as individuals. A really good example I'd like to share with you here. I once worked with an 18-year-old woman who had been born with a particular facial disfigurement. Now, this disfigurement had been uh, um, repaired immediately, surgically repaired, as soon as she was born as a little baby. But when she was a little girl in school, lots of the other ch children, children bullied her because of the mark on her face. And because of that, her self-esteem and her self-regard were really, really very low. So when I worked with her um, at the age of 18, uh, she combed her hair. She had long hair, but she combed it with a parting in the middle so that her hair was falling across her face. And that meant it was hiding uh, the, the disfigurement that she actually had. But this she felt more about. It was a psychological disfigurement more than it was a physical one now. But she had her hair across her face. And she said to me, uh, she was 18, she was a virgin, and she said that um, she... She was a virgin because of the way she felt about herself. And she said, but suppose I've ever got a boyfriend and um, and at one point, you know, we, we might want to have sex. Then how does a boy put a condom on? Because she was concerned that if he didn't know how to use it, at least she should. So I did a condom demonstration for her. And remember now, she's got her hair covering half of her face. And um, I did this condom demonstration, showed her how she could do this. And all of a sudden, she just looked at me and she said, Dave, I don't even know why I've asked you that question. She said, because with a face like mine, nobody ever wants to shag me anyway. Now, that's as low as she was feeling about herself. So that really is a true story. But I'm going to make this bit up now. So supposing the image that you see here on the screen, this is her. She always looks down on herself. She feels bad about herself. But at the same time, she's desperate to be accepted. Desperate for love, attention, affection, sex, relationships. Really desperate for that. So supposing she does meet uh, somebody. And at some point then, whenever that's going to be, they discuss having sex. And she says, well, look, I only want sex with condoms. And supposing he comes out with one of the excuses that are so typical and stereotypical of males using excuses for not using condoms. If she's got low self-esteem, chances are she's going to be more likely to say, mm, come on, let's do it then because she's desperate for this love and attention. And the third dimension of this is that she would be frightened of being rejected. If she insisted on using condoms, and if he really didn't want to, the chances he could go away from her. And then that would reinforce her low self-esteem. So if you're working with any clients at all, who are suffering under the pain of self, low self-esteem from whatever the cause is, that's something that really needs to be worked on, that they can help build themselves up, because the more they build themselves up, uh, the less chances that they will be sharing vulnerabilities around their sexual health and their well-being. And uh, when I mentioned earlier about using language and understanding meanings, this is just something to show you here that there are so many different understandings from terms that we often use, whether we're just using the word sex or gender or sex and gender. What do all these different terms mean? And then this will be something really good for you to do as well, to think through these. I've actually posted this picture um, on this learning resource for you, so you will be able to see it outside this video. Please think through some of the terms, and especially those that you're unfamiliar with. Look out ways of finding out what those terms mean, or again, share the ideas on Twitter. Ask questions on Twitter and see what people say. Another crucial issue around sexual health and well-being is that some people may turn around to you and say, well, thanks very much, but it's none of your business. And especially when people have been discriminated against or stigmatised because of uh, particular issues around their genders, their identities or their sexualities, they might even be nervous of being open um, 
outdoor open uh, to health and social care professionals, especially if they felt this discrimination from us as professionals. That's a real key point. So sometimes it's not that somebody's not being truthful or not being completely open and honest to you. They may not be uh, um, revealing certain things about themselves because of prejudice, stigma and discrimination that they've received from society, including our healthcare world. Okay, um, there's a book called uh, Stigma and Social Exclusion in Healthcare, written by Tom Mason et al. in 2004. And the whole book is focused on um, a concept within stigma theory, something called concealability and cause. And I actually wrote the chapter on sexualities in relation to concealability and cause. And what that means is when a person feels that they've been stigmatised for some sort of reason, so whether it's something about their genders or their sexualities, if they perceive that to be a discrediting um, aspect of their their personality if they came out and told others others may not like them because of this therefore they consider it something discrediting and if that's the case there's a chance that they may want to hide it or conceal it so the whole theory of concealability in course is well, what happens if you conceal something so say for example if um, if we look at the color of skin between us all so whoever you are as a learner and you can see what colour my skin is here. That's something we can't hide. The difference in colours in our skin, we can't hide that. But there are things we know about ourselves that we might conceal. But what's going to be the course or the outcome of that? If you're concealing something about yourself, at what point do you feel it necessary to come out about it? Why should there be any need for you to come out about it? But if you don't, what happens if somebody else outs you? about this particular issue. How will others deal with that then? And how will you deal with that then? So concealability in course, especially in the book um, on stigma and social exclusion in healthcare by Tom Mason et al, is really important here, um, a particular dimension of stigma theory that fits in really well with the stuff that we're looking at here today on safeguarding in relation to genders and sexualities and identities. You might have come across the name Michel Foucault, a French philosopher who died in the early 1980s. And Foucault um, wrote three volumes of a history of sexuality. And he's got some really key points that are relevant to us. And one thing in particular that he spoke about that we could think of in relation to safeguarding is this, the triple edict is the term he used, a triple edict of taboo, non-existence and silence. So think of aspects of genders or sexualities or identities where some people may consider that there's a taboo around this particular thing. Um, a clear example would be abortion. Look how in, the, in mainland UK, abortion is legally permitted. Okay, now there's a difference there. It's not legal, it's legally permitted under certain circumstances. And by the time women on mainland UK, by the time women reach the age of 40, at least one in three will have had at least one abortion. And yet it's one of the things still, crowded, uh, still shrouded in taboo, non-existence and silence. Because people don't feel that they can come out about it, therefore it's concealed. Because they don't feel as if they can talk about this, Therefore, it's as if it's not a big issue, it's non-existent, and the silence keeps it hidden. Okay, so really important to think of that. And finally, on this uh, particular third video now, here's one, th one other thing to think of in relation to any forms of discrimination that people experience. So um, stigma, discrimination, prejudice, all of those terms together, um, explore what they mean and see the impact of them, especially in relation to genders, identities and sexualities. Because if somebody feels that they're being stigmatised by others, that others are making up their mind prejudgment or prejudice about them and therefore discriminating against them, sometimes that stigma, prejudice and discrimination might be out there, it's overt and it's quite verbal from one person to another. Or it may be something hidden 
and sometimes look at the ways in which healthcare services may dis or no professionals within healthcare services may discriminate against certain people. It may be the fact that someone's put into a side room so that they can be ignored, or the fact that somebody gets harsh treatment as opposed to somebody else. So there are lots of ways in which prejudice, stigma and discrimination may be both out there and open, overt, or in very subtle ways and covert. But also it's important to remember that this can be internalised within in, in, in an individual. And sometimes, especially with some of the what's called the phobias in uh, sexualities, so homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, sometimes it might be in people who are struggling with issues themselves who might seem to be the most discriminating against others with uh, similar characteristics. So that could be internalised homophobia. And when it goes between one person and another, that's the interpersonal. But you can also see on this slide, it talks about within cultures, and that includes religions as well. And it can be within particular institutions. So it's really important to realise that all the stuff we're talking about, especially in relation to safeguarding, we need to safeguard people against stigma, prejudice and discrimination too. OK, thanks very much for listening.